Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, today we have on the show Mark Vigers, the Chief Operating Officer of BGC Consultants. Mark provides us with some insights from the coalface with a great discussion about what it feels like to be on the inside of a company involved in a merger and the tricky issue of integration. During this episode, Mark recounts his experience of being inside a financial services organisation that had been bought by a significantly larger offshore parent company who was looking to expand their business geographically. We talk about Mark's insights from the inside, the key things in an acquisition that can add to the future value of the combined entity, and his experiences as part of the due diligence team that helped him drive the acquisition and integration exercise. So without further ado, let's welcome Mark. Well, thanks, Mark, for coming onto the show. We're really excited to have you here on the Deal Room podcast talking about a bit of a different aspect, uh, I guess a different perspective to many of the people that we talk to who are usually talking about M&A experience from the outside or from the owner um, perspective. So I think it will be really interesting here today to get your, uh, your perspectives of what it feels like on the inside. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and hopefully something of what I've learned and had to share will be of use to people. I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it will be. So maybe in order to kick this off, can you give us just a quick overview of uh, when you came into the business? So at what stage of the transaction was the business at and, and how were you involved? Certainly. So, um, uh, so it was a large financial services uh, organisation that had been uh, bought by a significantly larger offshore uh, parent company in the same business, looking to just expand their business geographically into this part of the world. And sorry, can you give us just like a, a quick overview of you, you know what's the approximate staff numbers here, just so that we can get a gauge on on size? Oh, so um, parent about ten thousand globally, uh, locally about a thousand. Yeah. Okay. All right. Australia and New Zealand. So you know, reasonable size organisations. Um, I joined them as a, a general manager just at the point where uh, the deal was cementing. Mm. So I came in knowing that they had been uh, purchased and knowing that there would there was going to be a, you know, a some form of transition and transformation uh, exercise that we were going to go through. And you know that I guess the the that activity then extended over really the next three years. Uh, while I was there, uh, they were sort of still working at, at, at bedding in uh, what that ultimate transition state was going to look like. And that's, I mean, it's a really interesting comment from you that three years later they're still betting it in because I, I think, generally speaking, my perception is that uh, it's rare that acquirers will look at a transaction and uh, really in their minds forecast that they'll still be betting this down in three years' time. <laughs> What's your thoughts? Like is that yeah. – do you think this was in their mind at the beginning when you came on board? No, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. I, <laughs> I think originally they had about a 12-month view and then that was terrific and, you know, everyone would sort of all be um, singing from the same uh, hymn book. Yeah. But, um, but I guess there are a few things – uh, that, that I would sort of start with some of the thinking. And, and one of the things that was immediately obvious coming out of the, the process was that during the diligence, it had been a very small team. It had been a very small group of people who'd been involved on either side of the organisation. Sorry, do you mean in the acquisition and divestments team? Exactly. Is that the transaction team. Yeah, right, and, right, during right. The, and, the, and the diligence and the discovery phase. So even from a discovery point of view, it was quite interesting for me in a relatively senior role within the organisation to find myself in conversations where I have an expectation that there's other people in the room who, right, you've been part of this, you understand where they're going, what they're doing, and most people were kind of like, no. 
no, um, we kind of we knew we were being bought, but we weren't actually part of the, pro- of the exercise of designing how this was going to work. And these were all key leaders in the business and predominantly the people who led the parts of the organisations that did stuff. Mm. So, you know, sales, operations, back office, uh, you know, really it was, it was confined to a very small group of the executive and finance who actually knew what was meant to be happening sort of post the champagne corks popping. Mm, okay, all right. So th- there's this real problem of communication flow in relation to how it's meant to look or, or how transition and integration I- is meant to map out. Is that what you mean? Well, it's also a case of um, and you, you're dealing with a mixture of sort of a lack of in- information and understanding and probably a little bit of sort of shock and, and, and awe at the whole thing. But quite often in those very early meetings, particularly with, you know, some of the more senior people in the business, They'd be saying, right, we're going to do X. And so X would be discussed and go, well, how exactly are we supposed to achieve X? Because here's now the the laundry list of things that we would need to consider. And in some cases, you would find it's not going to work. Or there's a very, very significant um, hurdle, be that people, process, technology. Uh, In some cases, some of the things can be regulatory. Mm particularly with an offshore acquisition coming into a different market, financial services always highly regulated. And in some cases, going back to the people in the parent organisation saying, that's going to be a little bit tricky because we can't actually do that the way you would like that done here. And I guess one of the, my key things is that, uh, you know, from a, an acquisition perspective, it's about value. It's about acquisition of value. It's about future value that could be achieved by the combined entity. And these are all things that having, I've lived on both sides, both being in the acquired organisation and also driving the acquisition and integration exercise, that if not considered as part of the deal, from my personal point of view, it somewhat erodes, let's just say, the foundations of what everybody's expecting to get out of it. And I know dealing and, you know, being part of a diligence team you know, sometimes it's painful because if you've got the naysayers in the tent sort of, you know, throwing rocks at and pulling at and tugging at uh, what's going to be happening in the post-integration phase, that can be very frustrating for the people who just want to get the deal done. But I would, I would always come back to, you know, if we want to strike a deal and know that the deal has a high probability of actually generating, you know, what the final spreadsheet said it was supposed to do, then you've got to look into these issues at least to some extent or you've got to have a very clear strategy on how you're going to approach these things very aggressively, very you know, forthrightly post the signing of the deal because if you don't, then it said one man's opinion, but it's, it, it, you, you've kind of got something that's got very, very loose foundations that you don't really know whether you're going to get the outcome. So in your experience that you've talked about to to, to the extent um, of your knowledge, was there... Um, was there was there a clear integration team? I guess that's my first question. There was an integration team and there were certainly people who were um, uh, uh, tasked with, you know, engaging and driving the integration. I think one of the challenges was, and this also comes down to, you know, how you construct the financials and what it is you consider to be the necessary integration exercise. There were really only a very, very small group of people for whom the, the integration exercise became their day job. Mm. For everybody else, it was we're integrating and this is now something you're going to have to contend with and it's on top of your day job. Um, and my experience was there wasn't a lot of clear thought about creating the space, uh, headspace, capacity, time uh, for people to step away from their, you know, quite a lot, you know, every, every large organisation wants their people to be busy. Um, so stepping away from their normal busy day and continuing to drive value for the organisation in its present form to then be able to go, all right, I can clear my head here, let's spend the time required in the detailed conversations with the other parts of the parent organisation that we we actually uh, want to work with. And probably one of my other observations is it's very tempting um, as part of, a, I guess, a deal and then a post-integration say, say, look, um, 
we're going to leave it alone for the first six or 12 months. And that's, that's I guess, on one sense, you can say, well, that's good. That's going to minimise the disruption. But you then need to have a very clear strategy on what you're going to do during those six months to prepare yourself for the ultimate integration. And one of the other things that's really interesting there is you've then got to bear in mind you're going to have integration costs someday. It's just what financial year they're going to fall in. Mm. And so if you haven't sort of made it very clear to the business, yep, we're going to leave it alone six months, 12 months, doesn't really matter what the period is. Then we're going to start doing integration activities. Well, okay, well, what budgets have you made available? What provisions have you made to fund and drive those activities in subsequent years? And if you're doing a leave it alone for a period of time, you're talking year two, year three, big, or maybe even out to year four. Um, and you've got to consider that because um, if you don't, then uh, where you end up is the, the whole integration exercise becomes stilted. So your experience of, of this particular example, hmm. what what was the impact then? I mean, were there, was your experience in this particular situation that they had a leave it alone for 12 months approach and then everything started to happen at the end and that then created it's some sort of issue when hmm. everyone was trying to focus on business and growth of business. Is, is that how it played out? It is. And I think probably uh, there's also different ways. Um, technology wasn't too bad. That, that went okay. Um, general sort of tooling and delivery approach was, was reasonably well aligned because the two organisations were in the same industry. Right. Um, I think where it manifested most uh, interestingly and, and was in product, so uh, I think this is particularly in an area where you've got uh, an organisation that's acquiring for expansion of, of territory or market rather than expansion of capability is there was a, a quite a significant um, misalignment from a product and product strategy point of view between the parent and the acquired organisation. And that played out in a sort of a, a, a rolling ball of challenges and conversations between the local organisation and the acquiring organisation where they'd say, we don't understand your product. Okay, well, let's explain the product. Oh, hang on, that's really different from what we do. Yes. Okay, well, can we use the parent product? So, well, okay, well, let's do a functional comparison between the two. Do we have adequate equivalence between the two sets of products so that we could just adopt because we've got term contracts with major organisations in this market here that say we're providing this service to them for the next three years. So if we're going to do that, it's got to be transparent. Mm. Everyone stops, stands back, has to think about that and goes, okay, we can. It's, a, it's not hard to work out the functional gaps between, but then they go back and they start costing it. Mm. So, well, what's it going to cost to make the global product do what the local market needs functionally and then you, the side thing that everyone then comes back to and say, and what's it got to do to be able to comply from a regulatory perspective? I, mean, I saw some challenges as simple as getting people to understand, you know, data sovereignty mm. uh, requirements in Australia for, you know, personal identification information, financial data, saying, well, yeah, that's got to stay here. Well, they sort of got that and said, okay, well, if we're going to use the global product, how do we do that? How do we establish that? How do we make all of that happen? And so what I saw that doing was that then start saying, okay, well, we're going to have to have a strategy that's going to go out. Uh, the longest one I saw written up was six years. Mm. And these were on very, very core to business type product sets um, because they're saying, well, there's, there's no way that we can uh, afford to do the concentrated work to be able to use the global product in this market in the timeframes you originally expected. So now what we've got to have is this, you know, tail strategy. And the problem for that from a, a you know, I guess from a value perspective is mm. let's say it's the local product that's going to see. This would normally be the case. So do you stop development? Uh, what are your competitors doing? Mm. So hang on, hang on. If we stop adding new features to this, all of a sudden this market position, which might be part of the reason why the parent bought it in the first place, can erode. Oh, but hang on, but we don't want to be investing in two platforms at the same time. 
So I think it's it's very much a there's a there's a lot of things of this nature that uh, aren't considered, and I've seen it just on both sides, both you know in the diligence of being the acquirer and also being on the acquired side, that aren't looked into, that are just value eroders because if you haven't considered them, you, you, you're just going to struggle to make the money you want. And so are you, are you aware of, I guess, of any bottom line differences between perhaps what the acquirer had forecasted for the business and, and the impact of uh, of these integration um, issues that you're talking about, how that flowed through, I guess, to the ultimate result for the acquirer of the of this particular acquisition. I think um, there was more than one factor in play of some of the things that I'm thinking about. But the the, the organisation had been acquired had been on a very very strong growth trajectory. It had been mm. uh, very solid numbers and well outside of organic probably a, a, about, say, a three multiple on what you would have called organic growth for an organisation in their sector. And that, of course, was also part of what made them so attractive. What I saw was the being pushed pretty much back to organic. Right. It's interesting because, of course, that's not what an acquisition is meant to achieve, right? <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's meant to be leveraging. It's meant yeah. to spur growth. It's meant to, you know, drive and create new capabilities and and, and spur this this creature on further. Um, and there was more than one factor creating that, And um, but it was manifesting in year one. And, uh, you know, part of the struggle there was, and, th- and that's where I saw a lot of it, was in the product space mm. because it's like, okay, well, the way that the, the, the organisation had been growing was because it was very innovative in product and it was, uh, it was an acquisitive organisation itself. It was always adding new things to the mix, adding more value and increasing its value stack within its existing clients because it was very heavily saturated. It, it had a very established marketplace. Really, the primary way for it to grow was by increasing wallet with its existing customers rather than constantly acquiring new ones. So they were always adding to the capability, always building it out to be a broader suite so that they would deepen the relationships with their big customers. And then when that became stymied, it made it very difficult because it it kind of took the organisation back to what its organic growth would be, Mm. which was essentially just in line with market. Um, I mean, there were some other things that that happened subsequently that put some some more headwind on the organisation overall, but that, that was, you know, definitely a very clear trade that because they didn't have a really good product strategy going in, it was just this sort of you know, rolling set of challenges. So so looking back at, at this experience of yours, at uh, I, I guess watching um, problems occur, watching uh, approaches uh, that you felt perhaps could have been different and would have played out with a better outcome, what, what have you now taken from that as being the elements that you think acquirers should be looking out for, yeah, you, you know, to protect themselves from this sort of situation moving forward. And obviously, uh, you know, we're talking about two very sophisticated companies here. Yes, this is this is a difficult one. Mm. So tell us, what's the action points that you see having come out of your experiences? Okay, so I guess when I sort of was giving this some, you know, careful thought. The, the primary, the overarching thing is that if, if you're going through a diligence exercise looking on the acquisition of another organisation and if you don't actually have uh, a, a clear strategy that has at least involved, you know, the, the most critical stakeholders on both sides of the equation, which I think to some degree in my mind would always mean, you know, broadening the diligence team a bit, um, that's, that's meeting... Um, a strategy burden for all of the major operational areas of a business. So, you know, you're talking about product, finance, HR, uh, IT, their fulfilment processes. Then intrinsically the deal's built on, you know, not the best foundations. Um, You don't really have a plan for realising the value that the financial analysis said was potentially there. And, you know, without a plan, how do you know whether what it is that the financial analysis says 
is actually achievable. Um, another one which sort of popped into my mind uh, as, as we were chatting as well is that quite often a lot of work on a communication strategy into the acquired organisation, there also needs to be a really great communication strategy back into the parent organisation. Um, I was always, I can't say surprised, but I always found it interesting uh, in the circumstances where we go, we're doing this here, there's something similar uh, in the parent or something aligned, I'd say, oh, well, great, who, who runs that? Pick up the phone, ring that person. And they would have little to no understanding. They would have heard that the parent had bought this company, but there was no strategy inside the parent mm. either mm -mm. or how are we going to communicate this? What is it that we want our existing people to do with regards to this? What are the things that we can do from an engagement and thought leadership perspective that are all going to enhance the likelihood that we're going to get the outcome that we were looking for, which was, you know, this improved bottom line? Mm. Um, so I think that's the prim my primary thing that I take away from it is that you need to have that sort of thinking up front. Um, you need to be prepared to bring let's just say some of the more, um, uh, you know, I call them the naysayers, but the people who are, who are going to, to test it, who are going to say, mm, okay, but really how is that going to work? And, and I know that could be frustrating because it can seem like, oh, God, we could drag this out forever. That takes great leadership from the integration team to be able to manage that. But nonetheless, the thing I always come back to is, if you aren't prepared to sort of stare into that and do it well, then how do you know mm. that, that you're going to get the value because mm. you don't actually have a plan and strategy for, for the way you're going to achieve it? So everyone's just making it up mm. once, once the deal's done. Mm. It's fascinating. Um, th there's so many conversations that um, we have on this podcast and I, 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 and I think it stems from the fact that... Um, in many instances, we're as advisors from, um, you, you know, from the legal perspective and um, certainly many of the corporate advisors um, who we speak with him on this podcast, we're all very involved in, um, in the transaction phase and pre-transaction to a degree, but that post-completion period uh, is really where it seems the true difference is made between a good deal and a bad deal. Absolutely. Um, and there's just so many uh, stories of it not done well. It's just <laughs> really fascinating. I'm really looking, I'm digging around for some really good examples of where it is done really well. And But I guess all of this has dovetailed into, and, and I think that's probably a comment on how on the difficulty, perhaps, because mm. you can mm. have your financial models um, which uh, demonstrate a financial picture, but there is so much more that um, is attached to this tricky issue of integration. And that it seems on the face of it to be a very obvious comment, but the mere number of issues that we hear about is evidence of the fact that it's not given the due consideration that perhaps it should be in order to achieve success, whatever that means for any particular um, uh, acquisition. Yes. So, so I guess this dovetails then into where you are right now, Mark. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, how this has resulted in the um, consulting services in BGC Consultants. Certainly. So um, uh, BGC Consultants is, is a, it's a new consultancy and our approach is to bring together the most highly skilled and highly experienced practitioners in their various disciplines that, that are available and bring them to bear in a, in a coordinated, collaborated and orchestrated way to, to solve problems for organisations. One of the areas where, because of the you know, collection of skill sets that we've got, that we do feel we've got a very, very great strength is in this post-integration, post-merger integration, post -merger integration uh, sphere. You know, I've lived the journey uh, quite significantly in my corporate career 
Uh, and our approach really is to either whether it's, you know, our preference would be let's start the discussion about integration during diligence, but even if it's in the post-diligence phase is to be able to come in, understand the, 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 the scale of what it is that needs to be achieved and then distill that down into a strategy um, and using experts in the various fields. So it's not about, you know, somebody trying to be all things to all functions. You, you know, if you're going to look at HR, you've got to understand what are the HR challenges. You've got to understand the operational, the finance, the technology challenges, um, and that's our approach. We say, well, for a given integration, what's this going to take? Where's it going? What's it going to need? What are the pain points? Okay, we will construct the team of the right people to be able to, to build that work. And, you know, the, the, we're, we're a, a, a network of professionals. So I always say that, you know, you don't want the people who are going to be working on your project to meet on the day when they're first in your office. Yeah. yeah. Um, you want them yeah. to already be familiar with one another, know how each other works. Um, and so that's what, what we put BGC together to do because we saw a market need, particularly you would say in the, the medium size enterprises, say up to you know, about 200 million in turnover. And we also saw that there was a, a very interesting and capable pool of professionals who operated in their own consultancies mostly corporate backgrounds, but who had gone out operating in their own consultancies who had a real desire to work together in teams again. And so that's what we built BGC to do, to be able to sort of bring those people together, do it in an organised, orchestrated manner and provide those solutions to companies rather than those organisations having to be their own service integrators mm. because right now they'll maybe go and hire a, you know, a, a lead contractor and, bring a couple of service people together and none of those know each other and they don't always work well together. And that's, that's I guess, what we look at as our differentiator. We bring groups together who work well. Great. Okay. Well, look, thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for talking about all of your experiences today. And um, if our, any of our listeners want to get in contact with you, how do they do that? So the best way is to um, uh, come to us via the website. That's got all of our, you know, general information and it's an easy one. It's just bgc-consultants.com. Brilliant. And as always, we'll have a link through to that in our show notes. If you are lucky enough to be running along the beach as you're listening to this or perhaps less lucky in your commute on the way to or from work in uh, traffic. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, Mark, look, thank you so much for coming on board. It's been fabulous having you on the Deal Room Podcast. My pleasure. That's it for our topic today, Conversations at the Coalface, Life on the Inside of a Merger and the tricky issue of integration with Mark Vigers. In this episode, we really traversed a lot of topics and delved into some of the nitty-gritty of the integration process in m and We discussed what it means to have a well-prepared integration plan, which includes creating a pool of the workforce who will comprise the integration team, a team that is specifically tasked with engaging and driving integration. We also talked about constructing financials, the importance of communication flow throughout the integration, and the importance of a clear understanding about what actually needs to be achieved and how that is distilled into a proper strategy. So if you'd like more information about this topic, all you need to do is just head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com. There you'll be able to get links straight through to Mark. If you'd like to talk to him about some of these issues that we've talked about today in this episode, there you'll also be able to find out details of how you can contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal if you or your clients would like to discuss any legal aspects of sales or acquisitions. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. So don't hesitate to book an appointment if you want to find out how we can assist. And finally, if you enjoyed what you heard today, then we'd be ever so grateful if you'd pop over to your favourite podcast player and leave us a review. Well, that's it. Thanks again for listening into this episode. You've been listening to Joanna Oki and the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. (music) 
Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition. So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. 